100 years ago, a young man, Eugene Ely, took off in an aircraft from a ship at sea, a feat never before accomplished. Eugene Burton Neely was born in Iowa just as the 19th century was about to give way to the 20th and American ingenuity was advancing at an exciting pace. It was a time of invention with breakthroughs in electricity, communications and transportation technology. As a young man, Ely was attracted to new and exciting technology, especially automobiles. When his employer purchased an early biplane from aviation pioneer Glenn Curtis, Ely offered to fly it for him, thinking flying a plane must be as simple as driving a car. It wasn't. Ely crashed and, feeling responsible, purchased the wrecked plane from his employer. Carefully repairing the craft, Ely began to understand the aerodynamic principles involved in flight, and soon he was flying his biplane in exhibitions. In 1910, the aviation world was a small world, and it wasn't long before Ely not only met Glenn Curtis, but had gone to work for him as a test pilot. As a businessman, Curtis hoped to sell a seaplane he had developed to the U.S. Navy. The opportunity presented itself in October 1910, when Ely and Curtis attended the International Air Meet at Belmont Park, New York and encountered Captain Washington Chambers, the Navy's officer assigned to administer aviation matters. His was not an easy task. The Navy was far from convinced that aviation was part of its future. Twelve years earlier, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt had strongly urged the Navy to conduct experiments on Samuel Langley's pioneering flying machine, but found little support for the idea. The Army, however, was exploring the military uses of the airplane. The Navy sent observers to a series of test flights in 1908 conducted by the Wright brothers at Fort Myer, Virginia. But the board maintained the position that naval aviation was something whose time had not yet come. The more Chambers learned about airplanes, however, the more intrigued he became with the possibility of naval aviation. But there was just one problem, he thought. How exactly would the Navy use an airplane? How would it launch planes when the fleet was at sea? Curtis's answer was a seaplane, but to Chambers, that seemed impractical. The plane landed and took off from the water. There had to be another way. By the time Chambers encountered Curtis and Ely at Belmont, he was convinced that to be practical, a plane had to take off and land on a ship. The problem was proving that it could be done and being the first country to do so. Chambers had already spoken to the other U.S. titans of aviation, Orville and Wilbur Wright. The Wright brothers wanted no part of such an experiment, branding it as dangerously foolhardy. But Ely rose to the challenge in part because he possessed that daredevil spirit that set the standard for aviators who would follow. World War I aviators started this uh, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. I don't think in our era that's quite true, but the aviator still does like to fly, and he still does like to celebrate life at the club. The experiment quickly became a top priority. Workers at the Norfolk Navy Yard hastily constructed a wooden platform 80 feet long and 24 feet wide on Birmingham's forecastle. The platform sloped at 5 degrees with its forward edge 37 feet above the waterline. On 14 November 1910, just over a month following the chance meeting with Chambers at Belmont Park, Curtis's pusher biplane was loaded aboard USS Birmingham, moored alongside a pier at the Navy Yard. Birmingham left the yard, heading for the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay. Because the severe weather, rain and sleet, was so bad, the captain anchored one quarter mile off Old Point Comfort. Ely's flight gear was a curious ad hoc collection typical of an enterprise lacking a budget. His headgear was a well-used leather football helmet. For a personal flotation device, Ely couldn't swim and was deathly afraid of the water two bicycle inner tubes crisscrossed his chest. 
The weather in Virginia was deteriorating quickly and Ely decided to take off with the ship at anchor instead of underway into the wind. It was a risky move, but time was running out. At 3.17 p.m., Ely revved the engine and started down the platform. When he reached the end, clearing the platform, the tiny plane dipped toward the water before rising just in the nick of time. Ely was airborne. He had just become the first man to take off in a plane from a ship. Other experiments would follow, solidifying aviation as a key element of the fleet. And over the next century, the U.S. Navy would repeatedly demonstrate the value of aviation. But it all began with three men who dared to dream that planes could take off and land on ships, giving the United States wings for the Navy.